So this last video for chapter four, we'll look at these redox reactions with respect to their electrical potential. And we'll also look at the environments in which these redox reactions occur. And so let's start with the concept that we studied previously, because all of this is related to the free energy of the system. And so we defined free energy as the chemical potential of a process or the maximum work. Now, maximum work is a good way to think about it because we're going to look at how the chemical energy that's stored in the chemical bonds is converted to electrical energy or an electrical potential in the environment. And so, well, again, it's this um, energy, chemical energy that is converted and we can actually measure in the environment the voltage or potential or as your book calls it, the electromotic force that is generated from these reactions. And when you have a natural environment, there's lots of different reactions that are going on at one time. And so those reactions all produce this electromotic force that can be measured with electrodes. And so we're gonna relate the free energy with this electromotic force, this voltage that we can measure with electrodes. And so delta G equals negative NFE. F is just a constant. Faraday's constant, we need to consider the number of electrons transferred, and we have the voltage. So again, this electromotic force, or EMF, is the electrical potential exuded by a given redox reaction and is spontaneous within a certain redox environment. So it's the environment that allows these reactions to go forward. And so in terms of electromotive force, if you have a negative environment, that is a reducing environment. That means there's a lot of electrons around. There's a lot of species in solution that have electrons to donate. And that's going to create an environment that is negative. Or you have an environment that is oxidizing. That is where you have a lot of, of um, species that want to accept electrons. There's not enough electrons around. They are waiting for other species such that they can take them away. And so this would be an example of where you have a lot of O2 around. O2 wants to take electrons from lots of different things and make water. It is a spontaneous reaction and this is the usual case for oxidizing environments. Reducing environments there's lots of different species, but something like sulfide is one that is present, has lots of electrons to give, and also things like methane. Those are species that we would find in a reducing environment to have electrons to give and create this negative environment. So there's two measures of electromotive force in the natural environment. Geologists and environmental scientists, they use EH. And so these measurements are relative to the hydrogen reduction reaction, which we discussed previously when we looked at the tables. Chemists and engineers, they use PE, just the negative log of the electron concentration. 
And both of these are on a relative scale. So it's, it's not important what the number is specifically. It's more where this redox couple is relative to other processes, other reactions. And so for both cases, we can measure whether we have an oxic environment or oxidizing environment or anoxic environment, which would be a reducing environment. We could also use words as aerobic and anaerobic. Those are also commonly used. So let's look at a few examples of redox couples. And let's look at one that occurs in oxic environments. And so here's the couple. Oxygen and water are a what we call a redox couple. So we have the oxidized form and the reduced form. And so oxygen accepts electrons and it readily does so with another reduced species. And we notice that as written in this direction, as a reduction, we get a positive electromotive force or voltage. And that's due to the fact that, again, delta G equals negative NFE. We know that if delta G is negative, that we have a spontaneous reaction, meaning it will happen all by itself. Well, if that's the case, if we have a voltage that's positive, that means that the reaction will occur. So now let's look at an example in an anoxic situation, such as sulfur and sulfate. They are a redox couple. And I have it written as an oxidation. I have it written such that electrons are given up. So sulfur would like to donate electrons to some other species. And written in this direction, this reaction is also positive. So this is a reaction that is spontaneous and creates conditions, creates an environment where there are lots of electrons around to reduce things. And so this is would create a reducing environment. This reaction will create a oxidizing environment. And so what we'll end up producing, as I mentioned, this is all relative. So we end up making a potential ladder of different reactions from positive to negative. So you can see the relative potential at which these reactions will occur. And so here is an oxidation reduction ladder. This is useful. You know, you can go out in the field, measure the EH or the PE, and it would be in millivolts here. And this is usually, a ladder is usually produced at a specific concentration and specific pH. But nonetheless, we see all these negative couples we see where pyrite oxidizes to sulfate. We see where sulfate will reduce to hydrogen sulfide. This is also where hydrogen sulfide will oxidize to sulfate. So we're finding these lines in the, in the environment. This is in the environment. And once we reach these potentials, we will get these reactions to occur. So we see at the very top here, um, oxygen water, this is where its, um, its couple and potential lies. And it creates a EH. When, say, water is saturated with oxygen, you create an EH that is about 800 millivolts if that hopefully clarifies things. And so when we look at an anaerobic 
a reducing environment or aerobic oxic environment, oxidizing environment, we see that it does affect what species are present. So oxygen is present in a aerobic environment and not present at all in anaerobic. It just does not exist because there's too many electrons available over here that it, all the oxygen would be converted to water or we just react with other species. And we also in say for nitrogen in a aerobic environment, we'd primarily have nitrate but in an anaerobic, it would be in the form of ammonium. Iron and manganese are interesting in that in an aerobic environment, they form oxides. They react with oxygen and they form solids. They form either iron hydroxide, that's a parenthesis there, that's an oxygen, they form solid iron hydroxide or rust. Or for manganese, it forms a manganese oxide. So it, it's removed from the, the water because it turned into a solid. But at a certain reduced potential, negative potential, it will turn into soluble species you get manganese 2 plus and you get iron 2 plus. So these are redox couples where what you have on the left, you have iron 3 and over here you have manganese 4 plus. So again, they're in the oxidized form. They have positive charges. So this manganese four goes to manganese two, more reduced. Iron three goes to iron two, more reduced. And so again, we have high EH on this end, low EH or more negative on in the anaerobic environment. So I just wanted to show you some real data from the marsh. These data are gonna be from the oxidation ponds here and this is looking at soluble iron and manganese in the marsh. And so what we have set up in the winter time is more reduced environment. So we have a lot of ammonia, a lot of ammonium, uh, reduced nitrogen. But as spring goes along, we get a lot of wind driven mixing. We also get lots and lots of algae that just pump in the oxygen into the water. And at some point, this soluble iron, this iron two, this is iron two, and this is manganese two. This is in the water itself. But at some point, we reach a EH or PE, a potential that becomes positive enough such that it's converted to iron three. And when it's converted to iron three, iron three is not soluble in water at all. So it turns into a solid. It turns into rust and drops out. And the same goes for manganese. So the whether an environment is reduced or oxidized affects the species that's present for a given element. And so here is our couples for manganese. Here's the couple for iron. And so you can imagine anything below this point is going to be iron 2 plus and we'll get soluble iron. And anything above, more positive, we would get iron hydroxide. And the same goes for manganese.
So what we have here is a plot that's trying to bring this all together. So we have EH plotted against PH. And all these little black specks are different measurements taken from the scientific literature where scientists took different measurements in different environments. And what we find is this cluster of data. And we see that it falls between the couple for hydrogen reduction and oxygen, oxidation. And so this is the region in which all redox reactions occur in the different environments. So we can take this plot now and see that you know at low pHs, this is where you would find measurements, EH measurements at this pH you'd find in mine waters, rivers and streams that are fairly aerated, and also influenced by carbonic acid, we're going to be at much lower pHs. And then as you get towards pH of 8, we're getting into ocean waters that are um, oxygenated. And then as you move down the gradient of potentials to the more negative environments, this is where you have waterlogged soils and even groundwater is fairly negative. And this is just due to the fact that there's a lack of oxygen. And so other species, more reduced species are present because they're not oxidized. And so you should be able to make your way through a plot like this where you read pH versus the EH. And so last, this is an example of a plot that you should be able to read where we have PE now rather than EH, but again, it's a relative scale versus pH. And so what this plot does for sulfur this shows you what species would be present for sulfur at a given PE and a given pH. So we see at a positive pH, or excuse me, PE, we see more of the sulfate species. And then at more negative PEs, we see the sulfides. And so this is a pretty simple example, but nonetheless, it will show you with respect to pH what to expect in a given environment. And so these are very common plots that are used by environmental scientists. So you should be able to um, read a plot like this and answer questions given your knowledge about anaerobic and aerobic environments.